come to Burlington, you always seem like you're, you're welcomed here. Yeah, we always have a great time. We, um, we went to yoga class today at 12 and then went over to Stone Soup and had bowl soup. And All local food here. You're not yeah. going to find anything that's oh, God. from a corporation. So good. That's why I really like Memphis State too now. So good. I'm not a Vermont, I'm from across the lake, so I try, I can move from Plattsburgh. What's across the lake? Uh, New York. New York, okay. Across the lake Champlain. Yeah. So we got Northern New York over on that side. Of the yeah. The other side of us is Western New Hampshire. Yeah. And now where's Canada? Canada's straight north. Straight north. North okay. here about right, 40 miles now from here. Yeah. How many? We'll probably get to 40? Montreal in an hour. Okay. Yeah. Person. One of the biggest metropolises in the world is right there. So wow. That's why this is kind of an underrated place. Yeah. Uh, but it's cool to have an artist like you come out and really meet some people. Thank you, man. Thank you. And give them what they want, which Thank is you, some, some love and yeah. everything you have to give them. So yeah. keep them jumping. Now, what we're going to do is try to get some mic levels. So if you can see okay. how Okay. Oh, you got it? You got it. set. Okay. Great. So, um, just kind of speak a sentence. Okay, cool. That's powerful. Ten nine eight seven six five four three two one. It's Michael Franti here, live in Burlington. We're not live. You know that. <laughs> we are now. Okay, cool. Yeah. Now we're going live. Yeah. So, um, so I'm gonna start in Vermont because you're here, and the Green Mountain State loves you. And uh, thank you. It's 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 a small state. So, what are some notable moments you've had in the Green Mountain State? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is playing many shows at the Higher Ground. Just so many years and. Uh, uh, one time Trey Anastasio came and sat in with us and that was just like really off, off, the, off the hook. It was great to be, um, you know, I've been a fan of his for a long time and I didn't know he even knew who we were and he just popped in the show. I was like, man, can I jump up on stage and play with you guys? Again? Yeah, go ahead, you know. And um, the other thing is I, I practice yoga everywhere I go, so it's been a lot, I've gone to a lot of great yoga classes at a lot of different studios here, including today we're at Burlington Yoga downtown here. And, mm -hmm. Had a great class and great soup at Stone Soup, and you know it's like you get to go somewhere um, for many years. You start to, you know, look forward to to going there and, and experiencing things that you've had before. So it's good. Now, when I saw you last time, you were in Vermont. You were in Essex Junction at the at the Champlain Valley Expo. Yeah. You're wearing an Eat More Kale shirt. Yes. Now, Bo, Bo, right? Yeah, Bo. Bo. Was his name? How yeah. did you get involved with that whole movement? Bo gave me a Eat More Kale shirt about 10 years ago, and I, I eat kale, <laughs> and, and so I wore the shirt, and I had one for my kids, and for a while they were like our, our bedtime pajama shirts. We wore them like every night, wore them on tour, and people asked me, what is that shirt from, and I'd tell them. And, and then, uh, you know, the case came up where Chick-fil-A was trying to shut him down, and, and uh, I just thought it was unbelievably, it's like, you know, like how, someone, how, how a corporation can take the words eat more you know what I mean you could put anything after that and you know it's like saying like breathe more air you know and, um, so we were really disappointed to see how the case went down but and 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 Bo is a to me was always a great example of like a mom-and-pop style family business that was that was successful at what they did and they did one thing and they did it really damn well so it's a shame to see like a big corporation come in and, and uh, you know push the little guy like that. Now that's a big part of your message or music is the anti kind of corporate kind of feel. But in recent recent albums, I've noticed you toned it down a little bit. Now yeah. what what has motivated you to be a family oriented musician as opposed to you know give the corporation some complications mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of artist? Well, here's the thing. I, I really feel like the, the the problems that we see in the world today they need the attention of every single one of us. And like, for example, global warming, uh, we need the resources of corporations, we need the cooperation of governments, we need the wisdom of indigenous people, we need the spending power and everyday common sense of all of us, we, have the best. we need the best that science can offer. You know, and when we have everybody working on something like that together, then it works. And when it doesn't work is when um, you know, one, one of those groups monopolizes the, uh, the question or the equation. And uh, that's where, you know, when, when corporate uh, interests don't always work, you know, so we need, we need there to be a, a consensus. Now, in this whole music thing that you've been doing for your, what, you started making music in 86? Yes. Ironically, that was when I was born. And okay. So <laughs> 26 years you've been making music. Nice. Um, 
let's start with the beginning of making music. I read the Beatniks in yeah. six. So was that yeah. uh, University of San Francisco? Yeah, I started while well, I was going to school at University of San Francisco, and we go Dons. Yeah, go Dons. I played <laughs> basketball there, okay. and uh, we, it's right, very close to the Haight Ashbury district. So there's a whole history of you know Grateful Dead and punk rock and and um, so we formed this little sort of punk rock band and we got in a white van and toured around the country and just asked people at the end of every show is there some place we could sleep and we just sleep on people's floors and and uh, then we started with Disposable Heroes of Hypocrisy which is taking a lot of the sounds that we had done all these j industrial junkyard sounds of the beatniks and then put it into Disposable Heroes and then uh, you two found our record television the drug of the nation they started using that video to start their Zoo TV tour show and so we went from driving around this little teeny van to suddenly being invited on on tour with to open for you too and uh, I remember at the start of the tour you know I was like a fan of their music but not like a super fan I, I didn't really know the guys in the band and but Bono came up to me after the first week and he's like Michael can I have a quiet word with you and I was like sure is everything all right and he's like hey you know there's just this one thing I need to talk to you about and I was kind of worried like we we're gonna get kicked off the tour or something he goes you know, my guitar player. And I said, yeah, and he goes, his name is The Edge, not Ed. And the whole first part of the tour, yo, Ed, I like that hat. Yo, Ed, nice guitar solo. Ed, what's up, you know? And obviously it was enough that he had to go to Bono and go, listen, man, we like the band, but they've got to change this one thing. This guy got to remember my name, right? Yeah. So how do you say your name? I've heard it said many different times. Well. You know, my, I say Franti, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's other people in my f family who say Franti. And um, I say Franti because my parents are from, they're, they're first generation from Finland in this country. And in Finland, they say Frantila, which is the original name before it was shortened to Franti. So I pronounce it with the, the traditional way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, speak on that. Um, what kind of influence did your parents have on you, your mother and your father? Well, my mom and my dad adopted me when I was a baby. Mm -hmm. And they had three kids of their own. Then they adopted myself, another African-American son. And my mom was a primary school teacher for 30 years. She'd go and take care of like a big class of kids and then come home and have us five kids in the class, in, in our house that she had to, you know, keep from pulling each other's hair out, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and um, even though we we're all very different kids, different personalities, my mom was insistent that all of us be treated the same. And she also insisted that when we went out into our neighborhood, that we treat other people the same. And it um, didn't matter what school or what church or synagogue or mosque you went to, what color you were, what language you spoke at home, if you had two moms or if you had two dads, we were supposed to treat everybody the same. And, and that's, um, that's uh, the message that I've always tried to carry through my music. And I'd say it translates now because you're, you're helping more families embrace your music because the message is so on point. You don't have to worry about the wrong message. People worry about their kids listening to your music because your music would be the, the one that builds families. So mm. I, I respect that. Thank you. Um, speak to your, your travels in the Northeast now. Um, I, I've seen you in, at Mountain Jam at Hunter Mountain and yeah. I've seen you in Vermont. Where do you like to play? What are your favorite venues in the Northeast? Uh, well, Mountain Jam is great because it's such a beautiful outdoor setting and, and that time of year you get like four seasons in a day. We've had everything from, you know, hail, rain, wind, intense sun, you know. Um, and it's a great place because uh, it's a family festival. You know, you have every age, of, every spectrum of a person there. Um, we love uh, the... Uh, we love going to Maine. We love, you know, I, I can't speak for all the theaters and venues that we play because it's once the show starts, they all feel the same. There's just a bunch of people there. But we love it. We love the Northeast. I love the nature, and especially this time of year, we're just like getting into when the seasons are changing and it, you feel it in the air. And, um, uh, you know, we really love it here because when we travel, it's usually like a three or four hour drive to the next city, mm -hmm. which means we get to get out and do a lot of things in the town. Nice. Yeah. Now, talk about fans. What is a memorable moment you have? Your, your fans love you, so what is something mm -hmm. that really stands out to you to your fans? Well, um, we've had a lot of people that come up to me and say, you know, I met my girlfriend at your concert. And then 
two years later we got married. And now we're here with our baby. And we brought mom, who's now grandma, along to the show with us, you know. And, and that's like the greatest thing for us, you know. It's like when, when I was a kid, we would go on these long, horrible car trips, it's all stuffed in this station wagon, you know, seven is to go to camping. And we'd be like yelling at each other, screaming and hitting and punching each other. And my dad would turn on the radio and we'd listen to these songs and we'd sing along to these songs. And those songs became part of our, our life. And you know, they're just like ridiculous pop songs that were on you know, the mainstream top 40 station at the time. But they became like a part of my life and my childhood. So when I think of that, my songs becoming part of someone's life in that way, you know, it's like it really means that you've um, done some, you've, you've added something to, significant to someone's life and there's like a, there's a, that's a real, you know, a great, you know, gift. I, I mean, I can speak personally to that, yeah, I, I totally yeah. agree with you. So, um, going back to the, I don't even know where to go from here, but I had it and I lost it. Okay. Now, you're hearing songs on the radio you were talking about. Yeah. When did you feel like you finally made it as an artist? Was it hearing yourself on the radio or when did you finally feel like you had made it as an artist? Mm. You know, I, I don't think I've, I still don't feel like I've made it as an artist, you know, like uh, every, everywhere that we go, you know, there's just been like gradual steps of, you know, we put out a record and this many people come to the show and next time this many and next time this many and this many. But I have never measured the success in those terms. It's always like, what does it feel like when I write a new song? You know, what does it feel like when we visit a new place, you know? And to hear your songs on the radio, though, it's always exciting. You know, you get a kick out of it because you're realizing, wow, there's like 50,000, 100,000 other people who are hearing my music at the same time right now. And it's exciting. But the week that we had our first top 20 song, Say Hey, I Love You, uh, my appendix burst that week. And um, that was in 2010, and I put my first record out in 1986 or seven. So it was like 24 years of overnight success. You answered my next question. Yeah. I say, what's it like to, 20 years into your career, finally hear your song that really yeah. came out? Be in the top 40. Yeah. Well, you know, when if, if it had happened with our very first song and our first record, I probably wouldn't have a sense of appreciation like I do now of what it really means that um, people hear your music as they're going about times in their day, you know. And um, I think there's something re that's really special when you can write a song that has a meaning, has meaning to it. It's not just a pop song that doesn't mean anything. It's just something that, that I wrote from my heart and that it's connecting with somebody else while they're like at work or they're stuck in traffic or they're driving home with their kids from school or something like that. It means a lot to me. Yeah. Um, speaking to your songwriting, your recent album, Say Goodbye, the track on that, mm -hmm. uh, was inspired by Trayvon Martin? Well, there's a song on the new album called Say Goodbye and it's, it's inspired by, not only by, it's in part by Trayvon Martin, but um, it's inspired by all the places that have been around the world where I've seen people die far before that they should have, you know, in Iraq and in both with the Iraqi civilians and U.S. soldiers in Israel, Palestine, the Gaza Strip, the favelas of Brazil, East Timor, Sumatra, Indonesia, and in my own neighborhood in, in San Francisco and Hunters Point, you know, and, um, and so it's a song that's about saying goodbye to people that we care about. And uh, it's a song of peace that is really like calling, you know, in the, in the bridge of the song I say, you know, um, and all around the world you can hear the calling out, you know, about um, not having, a mother shouldn't ha never have to say goodbye to their kid. Um, now, which, this is a which came first, the chicken or the egg question. Yeah. What comes first, your lyrics or your music? Well, for me, the melody comes first. So I pick up my guitar and I start playing some chords and I just hum melodies. And I, if, I'm, if I'm really like actively writing, I'll, I'll record it onto my iPhone. I'll get the melody down and then I find words that fit the melody. And then as I'm writing it, I, I always have ideas in my heart of like, and in my head of what is it that I want to uh, say, you know, is there a certain topic of a song or certain emotion that I'm feeling that I want to get across. And then I find the words for that that fit with the melody. 
Um, I've tried in the past to write a whole bunch of words down and then trying to m shape those words into a melody and never has, I've never been successful at that. So I was just sing first and then find words a second. Now, what would you say to a young artist struggling to write music right now and try to make it as an independent artist? What, would you, what advice would you give them? Well, the first thing is follow your heart because you never know where music is going to lead you. You know, it's like uh, I never imagined that, you know, uh, after all the years that I've been doing this, that I'd be touring at the level that I was and enjoying it in the way that I do. So I enjoy it now more than I ever have. Um, but the main thing is to follow your heart because even if it takes you to just, you know, every three months do, doing a gig at a coffee house, you can find amazing satisfaction in that. It might take you to becoming a music teacher in a school. It might take you into being a manager for a band that's just starting or to opening up a studio or something like that. So follow your passion. And the other thing is, is work incredibly hard, you know, at what you do. So if you want to be a great songwriter, write all the time. You know, and write with other people, learn from other people, listen to all kinds of music, not just the style of music that you enjoy, but like dig deep into other cultures, other histories of music that can, that can bring inspiration to you. Inspirational. I think of that word and I think of the video that the fans sent and I was in it and hope for Steve. Now talk a little yeah. bit about Steve as a fan. Well, Steve December uh, and his wife Hope our fans, uh, they live just outside of Atlanta, and Steve had been writing to me for a while on Twitter and saying, you know, I have Lou Gehrig's disease and I'm progressively getting worse and worse and worse, and I'm gonna die soon. So his wife, Hope, sent me a message saying, Steve wants to come meet you at one of, the, at one of your shows in Florida. And so um, my better half, Sara, and I, we stayed up one night and we Googled them and we watched the video of their wedding and saw Steve when he was a very able-bodied young man very handsome and fit and then the next day we saw him and he was paralyzed almost entirely in a wheelchair and he came to the show and and I asked him how he had met his wife and he said you know we've been dating for a few months and I found out I had ALS and I told her I only have a few years to live and he said I would understand if you would go away but if you don't go away will you marry me and without any hesitation she said yes and so the two of them came to the show and Hope lifted Steve up out of his chair because he said he wanted to dance. She, you know, in front of 15,000 people danced. And um, after that, um, Sara and I, we were staying up late and so she's an emergency room nurse. And we've been trying to think of ways that we could combine what she does in healthcare with what I do in music. And we said, well, let's start a foundation that brings people with advanced stages of life-threatening illnesses. and. Uh, kids with severe disabilities and wounded veterans to live concerts. And so we started a foundation called Do It For The Love. And uh, people can go to doitforthelove.org and find out how they can participate in that, either as somebody who wants to come to a show or if you want to help others get to a show. I got another thing I could actually do it for the love person who's coming oh, to okay. <laughs> yeah. So if we give you ten, ten more minutes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're my actually, let me. Do, what time is it? Five or seven. What's that? Five or seven. Okay, they're they're they were gonna be here at five, so okay. we got a few. But Matt will probably come. Probably probably say that. Now you're my favorite artist. You're my idol. Oh, thank you. With you. Thank you. Producer of Channel Five, and I came up from college, and I, I started listening to you before I went to college. I mean, college transformed. I, I found acceptance. Yeah. I found love of acceptance and diversity and, yeah. and love and everything. So your music's obviously propelled that. Uh, letting that be the backdrop for this answer, who is your Michael Franti? Who is your idol? Mm -hmm. Who do you idolize music-wise? Well, my, my musical idols are um, artists who can tell a, a story about how much they love their lover, their girlfriend, their wife, their husband, and then put it right next to a song about how much they love the world. And so I think of Bob Marley, Marvin Gaye, um, uh, Aretha Franklin, uh, Stevie Wonder, Johnny Cash, um, John Lennon, you know, those are the artists that have really like inspired me in the way that they do that. And 
Like I think, for example, John Lennon, like if you listen to the song Imagine, it's like, you know, it's a song about this larger than life, like huge thing of the world, you know, imagine the world being a better way. But the reason that it, it resonates so much with me is because I hear a song like Beautiful Boy, like him, you know, falling in love with being a dad and falling in love with like this beautiful son, you know, that's just born. And, and, and then I think, well, because he loves his kids so much, that's why he cares about the world. That's why he wants to see the world be a better place. And so it means that much, that much more to me. So the artists who do that are the ones that I admire. If you could ask John Lennon one question, what would you ask him? Oh, I'd ask him for dinner. I'd ask him for dinner. Yeah, right? yeah, what do you want to eat, man? Let's chill. <laughs> yeah. Damn, that's kind of how I want to approach this, but it's like, well, I can't do that for life. <laughs> you know, I really appreciate this interview. Um, would you take a moment and sign some things? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, yeah. Self-indulgent. Yeah, no, no, no worries.